freedom was never meant to be an in and of itself. I know this is making people uncomfortable. Guess what wicked people with freedom pursue? Facts and truth. Facts and truth. And the truth shall make you free. I am greatly concerned that because of the things that are swirling around us, that the, the temptation and the tendency, both of them exist, that could cause us to attempt to sidestep God's processes in order to achieve a certain exalt. You cannot enjoy the benefit of God's results when we sidestep his processes. That's something we have to understand. We have lots of people that want the results that God affords us, but we don't want to go his way. We don't want to go his way. We have to, have to, have to understand this. That is why we endeavor to remind you every single day as you're transitioning from your part-time job where you generate an income to your part-time jobs. As you transition, guys, you are cultivating an outcome. Whether you recognize it or not, you are making disciples, whether you're doing it intentionally or negligently. If you are doing it negligently, the, the reality is most likely that you are not investing in forming disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. What, what you very well may be involved in is creating an environment where you said all the time more is caught than is taught. All right. Creating an environment with the things that are being caught from you are not the intentional, diligent, passionate pursuit of the Lord God and his will in our lives. We have to resist that temptation. Isaiah chapter 59 is what we're going to revisit. I know we've gone there before, but we have to understand the mechanism. When we stop and think about where we are, we cannot, uh, we cannot ignore how we've gotten where we are. Because if we don't understand how we've gotten to where we are as a nation, our attempts to rectify where we are will be skewed, will be inappropriate. We have to understand. So let's go back here. I've explained this before. In Isaiah chapter 59, in fact, chapters 40 through 66, all were written in the latter part of Isaiah's ministry. The purpose of his writing is to call Judah to repentance and to point the way to the Messiah. All right. In this particular chapter, he is diagnosing the sinfulness that is prevalent in Judah. I've explained before verses 1. In two, Isaiah begins by saying, behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that he cannot save, that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between your, you and your God and your, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Brothers and sisters, hear me well when I tell you this. This is one of the great deficiencies when you have socio-political commentary void of the truth of God's word. As my brethren, the Addison say, the straight edge of scripture. Socio-political commentary void of the life-changing impact of the gospel is literally nipping around the edges. Having no impact whatsoever on the root. You don't have to be born again to have a particular fiscal policy. All right. But you know what you do have to be born again to be? To maintain a God-centered morality that would enable you to navigate appropriately the wealth that would flow from a sound fiscal policy. Are you with me? Sociopolitical commentary void of confronting the true cause that causes nations to no longer be great. Sociopolitical commentary void of confronting sin is literally tiptoeing around the periphery. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm just telling you the truth. All right? The issue in our day, just as Isaiah said it, the issue in our day is not that God's hands are too short to respond. It's not that our God's ears are dull all of a sudden. No. The issue is sinfulness. Let me keep going. Isaiah goes on, verse 9, therefore, because of the sinfulness, therefore, justice is far from us. And I know I'm, I normally go through it more. Guys, listen, the reality of a lack of justice, the reality of truth 
having stumbled in the streets. The reality of justice has turned its way backwards and uprightness not being able to enter, as Isaiah goes on to explain. Those are not the causes. We have to understand they are the consequences. They are not the root. They are the fruit. If we solely address the fruit and never address the root, how effective do you think we will be in actually enjoying the types of change we profess to desire? Isaiah goes on. Let me just keep going. We grope around. We grope along the wall like blind men. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at midday as in the twilight. Among those who are vigorous, we are like dead men. All of us growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. Let me keep going. Verse 13. Verse 13, transgressing and denying the Lord, or as the King James says, transgressing and lying against the Lord and turning away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving in and uttering from the heart, lying words. The culture has no problem with lying, but you know who does? God. In fact, God says among the things that he hates are included what? Lying lips. We know about the hands that rush to shed innocent blood, but don't forget that the Lord has said he hates lying lips. Now think about how prevalent and how culturally normative lying is. Do I even need to say even in much of the professing church? Verse 14, justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the streets and uprightness cannot enter. Yes, truth is lacking. And he who turns aside from evil makes himself a prey. Guys, this is not my idea. This is what the word of God says. So it would be foolish for me to be literate and indwell by the spirit of God and see what's happening around us. Yet I mute on the issue of sinfulness. See, the reality is, oh boy. The things that are prevalent in our culture, it's very easy to point at our political opponents as if they are the genesis of them. Not recognizing, huh, I wonder how much I have contributed to the cultural norms that I actually don't enjoy. How may I have contributed? Let, let, let me say something else before I explain. I'm not the first one to say this. The word of God has said it first. Then we have founding fathers and patriots in our nation. Who recognize some of this truth? I will turn your attention to George Washington's farewell address. I've done this before, but I want to take my time and read provisions of it. In the midst of George Washington's farewell address, look at what he said. Quote, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. Now, you may not be a oratory gladiator. But indispensable means you can't do without it. <laughs> you need this here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? These are load-bearing walls for my construction mavens that are listening. All right? Of all the dispositions and habits that lead to political prosperity, listen, that lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness. These firmest props of the duties of men and citizens, the mere politician equally with the pious man ought to respect and to cherish them. A volume could not trace all their connections with private and public felicity. Let it simply be asked, where is the security for prosperity, for reputation, for life? If the sense of religious obligation desert the oaths which are the instruments of investigation in courts of justice. And let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Whatever may be conceded to the influence of refined education on minds of peculiar structure, reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. End quote. Guys, to summarize this, George Washington is saying, 
you want to have a real definition of patriotism? You cannot be a patriot unless you are affirmatively supporting the generational inculcation of Christ-like submission to the word of God. That's literally what he's saying. If you are interested, listener, dear listener, in establishing political prosperity, if you are interested, dear listener, in seeking security for your property, I'm sorry, security for your property, if you are interested in, interested in securing uh, security for life, it cannot be done unless we are inculcating a heart-based, Holy Spirit-endowed, biblically-anchored submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Guys, if you care at all about our country and our fellow countrymen, and you are a member of the Lord's church, priority number one has to be the propagation of the gospel and making disciples. Coming back to my initial proposition, how may we have contributed to our national condition? I will respond to that question with an additional question. What priority has discipleship formation held in your heart first then secondarily in your life? What priority has making disciples had in the Lord's professing church in our nation? It's easy to point at the world around us. It's easy for me to get up here every day and talk about J. Robinette Biden. It's easy to talk about this person didn't do that. This secretary of state didn't do this. These people didn't do that. But I am asking the question, who among us in our culture has our Lord declared to be the pillar and ground of truth? Who among us to whom this faith that was once and for all passed down to the saints, who among us is responsible for the propagation of that? What I am saying, brothers and sisters, for far too long, the professing church in our nation has been distracted and divided with all kinds of agenda, all kinds of priority, all kinds of building programs, all kinds of socializing, all kinds of social clubbing, all kinds of things. Where discipleship We can't hardly even spell the word. And what I am saying is that the things that have that persist around us, we very well have may have contributed to. And if we are going to make any changes in this, we cannot focus on political systems to the exclusion of what Jesus said is our great commission. Guys, what I'm saying, again, this is not in an effort to provoke any type of condemnation or anything like that. But in the midst of the, the fervor and the hysteria of the moment, it's very easy to be um, removed from an accurate perception of what's happening. All right. I've quoted before Adams, numerous founding fathers, you know, establishing the reality that our constitutional republic is only effective for the governance of an, a holy, religious, and moral people. Okay? Only. Guys, when you combine freedom with moral bankruptcy, guess what the freedom will be utilized to accomplish? When you have a people that have a constitutional republic with democratic features, with the esteemed privilege, unique in all of world history, to select their own servant leaders, Guess what type of servant leaders they'll select? For many of us, it's a bit jarring to stop and consider that when you think about that there are people in this world that recognize you got drag queens in front of three and four-year-olds talking about the hips on the drag queen go swish, swish, swish. For some of you, it's jarring to think that there are actually adults who will say, yeah, I want that. Newsflash. Have you, look, you remember, have you driven a Ford lately? Have you read Romans 1 lately? Guess what the Bible says an unregenerate heart does? It invent ways to do evil. So when mankind is confronted with this disease called a sexually transmitted disease that now we want to say a sexually transmitted infection, right? And men learn that A, illicit sexual activity could actually result in you contracting a disease that will kill you. Guess what men do? Maybe we should stop having this illicit sexual activity. No. Guess what they do? Let's figure out a way to keep doing it and not die. Are you following me? <laughs> See,
See, contrary to popular belief, freedom was never meant to be an in and of itself. I know this is making people uncomfortable. Guess what wicked people with freedom pursue? <laughs> the Lord's desire in planting his remnant in a locale, just like he has his remnant deposited all over the world. The Lord's desire in planting his remnant in a locale like the United States of America is so that that remnant would execute Matthew 28 verses 16 through 20 would execute Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. That salt and light duty would be implied, would be executed. That the Great Commission would be executed. We don't neglect civic affairs, no. But we certainly don't worship them, nor do we vote, devote ourselves exclusively to them. Why? Because we have a higher source of marching orders. And what I'm saying is, um, no, don't ignore what's going on around you. I've been saying live locally for how long? But in living locally, what are we seeking to be? Because what we're seeking to be will drive what we seek to do. If your objective is solely to make sure we have election integrity, so there's no cheating elections, what are you going to do when you find out or if you find out that a critical mass of the American populace actually prefers wicked leadership? These are the things we need to grapple with. I understand the, the, the threat that wicked government, and let's be clear, government populated by wicked people, <laughs> can, can the, the, the carnage that can be caused there. Which is why my civic engagement must be combined, must be tethered, must be, must be connected, or let me say it this way, must be motivated. By my eternity-based obedience. That's what I'm saying, guys. And, and if we would be honest, let's, let's just be honest, right? It's easier to wax eloquent about government. It's easier to do a, a get-out-the-vote drive. It's easier to talk politics than it is to actually drill down to start to discuss the depravity of the human heart. When you engage in a discipleship relationship, it's not a one-way street. Because guess what happens? Your own sinful proclivities are exposed as well. It's not like you're helping somebody else. It's reciprocal. It's reciprocal. And there are many of us who say, man, you know, I had opportunities for discipleship and I messed up in the past. And there's some that I, you know, I can't really address, whether that be with our own children or whatever. Guess what? <laughs> as Psalm 51 says, a broken spirit and a contrite heart, the Lord will in no ways despise. One of the most powerful uh Discipleship tools in our arsenal that the scripture says is not carnal is repentance. Getting our young ones who may not be so young anymore saying, man, listen, I'm learning things now about my role as a father or my role as a mother that I did not know before. Or if you knew them, but simply didn't have, did not have the inst inst institutional capacity to execute and implement them. Pull the little ones who are not so little anymore aside and say, listen. When I did this, I was wrong. I was wrong. And listen, there is no guarantee how that would be received. Some of you have experienced, man, my loved ones use that against me. Guess what? That may be an immediate response, but I guarantee you that will not be the long-term response. We, of all people, have got to see where we are a bit more clearly. We cannot afford to go along with the siren song of the culture. There is no question that it's Jesus who changes the hearts of men. That's why he, he commanded his children to be his ambassadors. There is no question about that. But the reality is, and I've said this before, politics is no, nothing but the externalization of religion. People do politically what they really believe. I got way further on this than I intended to go. But we, we, we cannot afford to sidestep the main thing. 
one of the primary problems we're having is that we have confused the meat and potatoes with the garnish or with the side dishes. We've allowed the resurrected king of glory to be relegated to a side dish, not in proclamation, but in the way we go about our lives. One of the major things that should be almost a, 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 a unified clarion call around our nation right now that the church of the living God should be saying, we need to be on our faces and we need to be proclaiming the gospel and making disciples. These things should be elevated to front burner concerns. This is more important than, you know, the late, latest program. This is more important than the children's program. This is more important than our choir swaying on beat. This is more important than all of that. Because look at the carnage that is around us. Look around us. All right, so let me point you all to this a little bit of, I guess, continued housekeeping. I wrote an article for AFA's site, The Stand. You simply go to afa.net and click on The Stand. It's titled, There is No American Monarchy. There is no American Monarchy. This article was written in response to the wannabe king, <laughs> Mr. Biden's announcement of his national... Um, and I got to I got to be careful because I'm, I'm tangling. I'm now tangling with some some big techies. All right. Got some things we got to deal with. So I'm gonna have to use a little bit of coded language today. Y'all know I don't do coded language. So but Mr. Biden's national edict. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Man, this is not a monarchy. Who slapped Joe Biden and told him that he was the, the reincarnated King George? Man, this dude is straight tripping. In this article, I provide a little bit of legal analysis as well as scientific data. And one of the major benefits I hope to provide in this piece is that it's in a one, it's an accumulation in one place of a bunch of different links to various studies and various actions where you can get it all in one place. You go to AFA.net, click on the stand. The title of it is There is No American Monarchy. I know there are some uh, tech companies that are not too, too keen on this article and i don't care share it with your friends uh definitely click and save the hyperlinks these are studies and things you will not get from goebbels inc but it's important that you have this information so that you uh, are best informed and best armed to be a benefit in your own life but as well as to those who are immediately around you the title of it is there is no american monarchy there's a lot of information there for you and Please go there and and check it out.